I enjoy what I do. It doesn't mean that I started off enjoying what I did. What it means is I've learned in whatsoever state that I'm there in to enjoy it. I've enjoyed being a provider. You know, the type of lifestyle that people say men should be or husbands should be. That they should be the provider in a home. Remember when Christianity was not so long ago, maybe 20 years ago, maybe a little longer, people were pushing hard about, oh, mothers stay at home, husbands provide for your wives. Well, that was a beautiful Christian model of what the perfect life should be. Kind of like what the Sermon on the Mount is. We know what the perfect life should be, how we are blessed and God is changing us inside to be these things, to love our enemies and to turn the other cheek and to do all these things. But the reality of less than 20 years, or I should say in my lifetime, I saw Christianity shift from, oh no, mothers, you need to go out and get a job because you can't provide for the household, family living because the husband no longer has a job. Or better yet, he's not even there. So we found society changing the reality of the paradigm of what a family unit was and is today became two-person income and that became the norm is that normal became the norm for guess what oh well you know never mind that a woman may be more qualified to teach we want man teaching even if he is stupid because then he'll grow up to be smart I don't know about you, but personally, I think when we sit down and look at the Bible and we look at Scripture, we find God moving in our midst to work out our salvation through the means with which sometimes our interpretation may be more of an interpretation than an application of the reality of where we are today. You see, I myself have enjoyed when I worked being the provider. I spent all my time working for my boss. I was a slave-driven person that just, man, I could produce. I was hard working. I was there. I sweated, you know, by the sweat of my brow and the work by my, my manifestation of my faith was in the work that I did and I performed for them, you know, and I made them profits, you know, I made them money, you know, and I was able to be that hard worker, you know. Wasn't always, you know, kept my mouth going sometimes, you know. Once in a while I got, you know, in trouble for that, but the point is, is that Everyone always was admiring my work, and I was fully and completely handicapped. Yeah, me, personally. I was challenged by having an ileostomy on my side, challenged by having Crohn's disease, challenged by having all these other things in my life that caused my health to deteriorate at times, or to be challenging me to act like, be like, and perform like a normal person. Because that's true, after all, that in those days was what society was. You see, it wasn't always about, you know, the handicapped recent, you know, things that we do see now as those that overcome and are wonderful examples of our faith. No, back in my day, it was more like, hey, I lived in a state where it said, you know, if you're handicapped, you need to go home and stay in the home, you know, and stay in the closet where you belong, stated by a city governor. And you know, it took time for the process of society to change and to develop into the place where it is today. And it wasn't always the way that you think it is if you're growing up in it right now. Matter of fact, it's not like, you know, that long ago that things were completely different. What can I say? Even the equal rights amendments that we talk about as though, I have the right to bear arms, I have the right to do this. I remember when it wasn't so much a right, you know. Quite frankly, if you had guns, you know, you were a threat. <laughs> Ku Klux Klan, Black Panthers. I mean, come on, let's get real. There were things going on that at the time were anti-societal, anti-government, that, you know, you can talk about Occupy Wall Street, but quite frankly, the 60s was a whole different story. We were revolting against the entire American system and doing a pretty good job of it. Times, they have a change. And the times, they are a change. So don't be surprised if God changes a lot in your life. That though you may have the ideal of what you think you should be, you know, 
oh, you're the breadwinner, you're the man, you're the example of what God wanted the family to be. No. God wants a family to be dedicated to Him, provided by Him, serving Him. My wife right now, you know, and I both are unemployed. You know, we're currently living on our unemployment, you know, and that will expire and then we won't have an income. And Currently, God has said she'll go back to work, you know, and we've had some open doors that might happen, might not, depends on him, you know, for her to return to work. And she enjoys lifestyle of working, and she wants to, her desire really is to, of course, be at home and to enjoy her grandkids and to do things like that. But her vocation and her avocation that the Lord has given her has placed her in a better place to enjoy her personality quirks and her style of living in her job environment where she is very effective at what she does. As a matter of fact, God is very directive in every job that she's had because she's ministered to the other Christians that were at her job and they ministered to her. And likewise, we find ourselves in that same situation when we put it into the realization of God being able to direct lives according to His will and not our own. Anyone can sit down and say, oh, well, this is the perfect family. It's going to be a husband, a wife, two kids, and that's it. Bingo. You've got it solved. You're going to have a car. You're going to have a dog, a cat, you know, a hamster, you know, whatever it may be. And that sounds good when you look at Mad Men or some TV show, you know, where it says something about the 50s and, you know, the early 60s when we thought, oh, well, this is the way that life is, you know, a chicken in every pot, as Harry Truman once said. And yet it didn't really work out that way. Because later you find the Kennedys going down into the South and discovering people that couldn't read or write, still to the that day. So, what we find is God is in control. God is the one who leads you. God is the one who directs you. As the Lord has led you, so be directed. When I was directed to go to work, I worked. When I was directed to remain on Social Security handicap disability, I was on Social Security handicap disability. When I received a non-service connected pension from the military, I was on it. Till the great, you know, Reaganomics era where everybody was loving Reagan, I was kind of like thrilled that he cut off all my benefits, you know, and made me like get out of my situation into working and nearly died. <laughs> oh, well, that wasn't quite the way that I pictured it. But the point being is that God rearranged and caused me to enjoy all those places that I had been in at the time as well as looking back on the time. I enjoyed those times that I was handicapped and laying in a hospital bed nearly dying. I enjoyed those times I went to work and tried to make it, you know. I enjoyed those times that I had gone through a marriage or two and then wound up divorced because guess what? I learned from them. I learned and employed God in every situation and circumstance of my life because God directed me in that part of my life. And it was like, wow, God directed you there too? Yeah. He allowed me the choices that I made when I prayed. And sure enough, whether you understand it or not, God directed me in the way that he chose for me to go. That I might be able to minister to those that need ministering to and to give that comfort with which I was comforted too, likewise, the same comfort with which you might need to be receiving. People talk about, you know, what is a uh, unforgiving situation, you know, where you can't forgive the person. Well, I don't know. I came home and, you know, I saw my wife in bed with another man, you know, and I forgave them both, you know, and gave them time to repent and get out of their situation, you know, and even then still was married. Or tracked down a wife, you know, that had gone errant, you know, or distant, you know, and tried to stand, you know, when everybody was telling me to stand, when God said, no, let go. Huh? Are you kidding me, Lord? That's not what you would say. Or is it? The ideal is always given to us in Scripture, as well as the reality of what life is. Abraham, as a man of faith, was given the ideal of walk with me and talk with me, and I will lead you into a land, and I will give you a inheritance that will be to all the nations a blessing. And so he did until he acted like 
he wasn't the heir of all these things and that he was going to have you know children in he split you know and kind of like blew it down in egypt so he wasn't always the perfect ideal of the man of faith but we are told he was a man of faith because in the end as he had gone through these experiences god brought him to the place of faith and god may bring you to that same realization through the experiences of life that you're going through you may not have understood your life or still don't understand your life of what you're going through but god is taking it to you and bringing it to you daily to have a realization of him in it there is nothing that is happening in your life whether you've done it right or you've done it wrong that he isn't using to bring in the light of his word to show you what he wants for you to learn from it to learn in it and to learn through it because there's always three aspects of it and more that could be applied whether you trust in the lord or not whether you've done the right thing or not whether you're in rebellion or not god is still working on you he didn't say he quit working with you because you rebelled no he said i've forgiven you because i know you can't do it i know you will fail i know you've been a failure and so that's where you come to a place where you can accept and actually enjoy where you're at whether in sin or not well yeah i'm in sin i need to repent you know and i'm i'm trying lord you know help me please you know not to be enjoying the sin because sin separates you from god and you'll feel that kind of like, yeah, I got one foot in heaven, one foot in hell, and I'm not comfortable with it. But rather, God wants to bring you to the personal choices of making a decision based upon that grace he's already given you that is extended to you for this matter of time where there will be a time where there won't be grace extended. But still, at this point in time, you have grace extended to you that you're learning to choose the good over the bad. Because you discovered in the reality of choosing the bad it don't work out so good as a matter of fact it works out bad i think that's why they call it bad because it works out bad and it don't work out good no matter how bad it is it don't work out good unless god takes that which was meant for evil and he turns it into good and god can do that when you turn it around to him and that's why you can enjoy you can rejoice you can employ god in every situation and circumstance of your life because god is there whether you'll accept it or not god has always been there and he's never forsaken you nor left you but whether your bed was in heaven or whether it was in hell whether you made the right decision or the wrong decision god did not leave you and become distant because of your sin as he did with the children of israel as he was long suffering in them and giving them 400 years of suffering without the knowledge of him or without the realization of a personal communication with him but rather god used them to bless in the long term all of the world through them that we might be saved from having to go through the same experience so that we would have a personal relationship with him daily without there having to be that interruption of 400 years or more for judgment to come upon the nation and the people as well as to test them and to try them so that they would come to the place of knowing him in a personal intimate way your life is a test it is a trial and it's a tribulation and you were meant not to go into the great tribulation so god is bringing you to a realization of knowing him in a way that you'll be able to make that determination that you should not go into great tribulation but that you'll go through tribulations as a son chastised by his father who is trying to teach him the lessons of life and cause you to grow into the person God wants you to be. On earth, only man has capacity for worship. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. Genesis 1, 26, 27. The one mark which forever distinguishes man from all other forms of life on earth is that he is a worshiper. He has a bent toward and a capacity for worship. Apart from his position as a worshiper of God, man has no sure key to his own being. He is but a higher animal, being born much as any other animal, going through the cycle of his life here on earth and dying at last without knowing that the whole thing is about. What is it all about? If that is all for him, if he has no more reason than the beast for living, then it is an odd thing indeed that he is the only one of the animals that worries about himself. He is focused on himself. That wonders that ask questions of the universe. The very fact that he does this 
these things tells the wise man that somewhere there is one to whom he owes allegiance, one before whom he should kneel and do homage. The Christian revelation tells us that one is God and Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, who is to be worshipped in the spirit in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. That is enough for us. Without trying to reason it out, we may proceed from there. All our doubts we meet with face-wondering affirmation, O Lord God, thou knowest. An utterance which Samuel Taylor Coleridge declared to be the profoundest in human speech. Bible Christianity or Biblical Christianity needs to recapture the spirit of worship with a fresh revelation of the greatness of God and the beauty of Jesus. And you know, the Lord knows. The Lord knows where you are. The Lord knows what you did, how you did it, why you did it, and even more about it than you even realize that you did do about it. Because he sees the insides. But he's trying to bring you to realize that even in all of these things, whether you were growing, knowing, flowing, showing, or developing, or learning, or process of being crushed, or abased, or exalted, you can rejoice. You can worship. You can thank Him. You can be a part of the experience of being something more than what you are. Something more than the flesh that the animal, animistic world we see around us, the animal kingdom that we see that we're not a part of, but that we act like at times, even to the place of calling ourselves by those names of, you know, dogmatic or whatever it may be, but being like animals, we can choose to be something more than what we appear to be in the world. And that's a worshiper. That's a person who seeks after talks to, walks with, and acknowledges that there is a Lord God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, who worships him in the beauty of holiness, which is captured in the grace that you've been given, the long suffering that God has allowed you to go through these experiences in life, so that even in the midst of them, in every stage of your life, you've been able to thank him. You've been able to worship him. You've been able to call upon him. You've been able to know him. You've been able to ask him, to seek him, to follow him, to worship him in a way that you didn't think you could have until you did do what he said to do. Worship him in spirit and in truth. Because the truth is you are a sinner saved by grace. There's nothing great about you. There's nothing good in you. All that you are is as filthy rags. All that you'll ever be is not much accomplished more than what he has made you to be. But in that what he has made you to be is to worship him in spirit and truth. The reality of what we are meant to be is to know Him, and that is eternal life. And to know His Father, which is what Jesus said that we should know, because if we know Him, then we know the Father. But that God sent His Son so that we would know the Father, is to worship the Father, and to worship the Son, and to know them in spirit and truth. So really what life boils down to, bottom line, really, is not just the knowledge of, but in knowing them, worshiping them, loving them, experiencing them, as you may have seen in much of what you call a worship service. But the worship of God that is manifested in all your day-to-day -day existence is simply in the reality of what you do now, today, this moment, knowing Him, seeing Him, hearing Him, walking with Him, talking with Him, and loving Him. Because you see, when He didn't forsake you because of your sin, when He didn't forsake you because of all the things that you've done, when He didn't forsake you after you became a Christian, and He continues to love you with that long-suffering that His mercy endures forever that the children of Israel declare over and over and over again, then you begin to realize that, guess what? That kind of love poured out upon you responds in you pouring back to Him the same love you've been given. And when you've been loved like that, in the midst of all your failings, when you've been loved no matter what you've been through or do, man, it changes you. It makes you. It rearranges you. It, as a matter of fact, burns out of you all the dross. It makes you pure in His sight. Because our God is a consuming fire and that fire is the 
efficacy of the purity of what he is in his nature and that is love the pure love is a consuming fire and it will consume all that is not of its same nature so the purity of what God is is what he's trying to bring out in you to respond to the same love that he's given you and that is to love and be loved as Jesus demonstrated his love for you in the same way the same place and the same time that he has done it today which is just love love really is the answer to the summation of all there is in the realization of eternal life and that's what worship is it becomes that observable means of the demonstration of the emotion and the devotion of the fruit of the Spirit that God is of his nature coming out of you which we call love it's not quite the way the poets defined it but it's the way that God arranged it and you might find it not only in heaven but on earth in you